Bwana Yesu asifiwe. A joy to be back here again and to share the word of the Lord with us today. This is the third Sunday I'm sharing with you. I'll be taking a break briefly and allow James Bernard to come this coming Sunday and a few others to come in the new month uh, before I am back. But I trust that this, this has been helpful. Has it been helpful to you? Kindly show me by the raising of your hand if the teachings have been helpful for you. Thank you. And I believe that as we keenly, as we keenly sit today and just receive from the Lord, I believe that God will speak to us. I was looking at the picture that is just behind me here. I don't know whether you sometimes get an opportunity to look at it well. And I have, I have the privilege of being in the front. And so I see it up front. And as I looked at it, I was basically imagining the overflow. The overflow. Can you see the overflow? The overflow. Something overflowing. That grace that we are talking about from the Lord our God just overflowing over me and causing me to do those things that are difficult, that I am not able to do because of the overflow. And so the purpose of this picture is that every time you are there and you are either singing in worship or we are praying or you are, you are listening to the word, you keep the picture of the overflow of the grace of God over your life as a promise of God and as a reality that all of us are going to experience this year in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we're looking at the overflow of grace and godliness, both overflowing. Grace is overflowing over me, and godliness is overflowing in me. But we are looking at it in a certain context. Last Sunday, we looked at it, the overflow of godliness in the context of poverty and lack and difficulties. Today, we are looking at it in the context of suffering and conflict. And I know somebody is almost switching off on me now. Those of us who don't believe in the theology of suffering and conflicts around us. Our main scripture is Matthew chapter 14. If we are able to project it, Matthew chapter 14, we can read from the NIV version. Oh yes, there it is. Are you able to see it? Okay, then we can read uh, from verse 22 all the way to verse 33, 10 verses, and we'll get the gist of what the Lord desires to us to hear this day. I pray that your heart is filled with longing to just lay hold of that, that word that the Lord has for you today. Because in that word is your blessing and your victory today. So can we read from verse 22, 1, 2, 3? No, you don't look convinced. Let's read it. Okay, let's stand up on our feet kindly. Let's all honor the reading of the word of the Lord and read it with oomph, okay? Let's go. One, two, three. And go on ahead of him to the other side. Uh -huh. While he himself Battered by the waves, because the wind was against them. Mm -hmm. Immediately Jesus spoke to them, have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid.
And he saw what? And those in the boat worshipped him and said, Truly, you are the Son of God. As we stand like that, shall we just raise up our hand and ask him to speak to us? Open my understanding. Open every faculty in me that will understand that which you speak to us today. Allow that the word of the Lord will sink deeply in my life and in my situation, and rule over all that is in me, that I may honor and glorify your name. I submit to you, and I surrender to you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. Kindly, we may have our seats. I take note of a few things, although the scripture changed from NIV to another one, NSCB, somewhere in between. But I take note of a number of things which I'm going to be talking about. Let me just uh, I highlight some of them. As I also take time to invite those of you who are following us online, we appreciate you so much. Thank you for taking your time and tuning on us so that you would follow with us today what the Lord is doing. Now, the Bible is giving this story of the disciples uh, and, and Jesus. And it's saying Jesus sent them away. It was after the situation where he had multiplied two fish and five loaves to feed over 20,000 people. And then after that, and he had fed many people. Then after that, the scripture says he sent them away to go back on the other side. But I take note of what the Bible says, because the Bible says, but as for him, he was left behind. He went on to the mountain to do what? He went on to the mountain to? Jesus had a lifestyle of prayer. Jesus spent many times, in fact, it says he went alone of himself without anybody. Jesus had a lifestyle of withdrawing himself to be alone most times on the mountains so that he may be able to pray. Is that your lifestyle? If it was necessary for the Savior to observe moments of withdrawal from businesses, withdrawal from friends, withdrawal from activities, that he may be alone with the Father to hear him, to pray to him, what about you and what about me? Meanwhile, Peter and his friends, the disciples were on a journey from where they were to the other side using a boat across the waters. But the Bible says that the waters became boisterous. I love the NIV because I think it says boisterous. The waters became boisterous. The waters were beating on them. As they went on this journey. And I think of ourselves, friends. Life is a journey. This thing you and I are going through every day, it's actually a journey. We are all on a journey. And just like the disciples on their journey, life's journey becomes sometimes boisterous. Do you agree with me? The journey of life sometimes, if not most times, becomes boisterous. This is true for everybody. For those who are children of God, for those who are non-believers, this is a reality. And some of us, when life becomes so boisterous, 
with too many things that are beating around us, some of us choose to run to church like we have done today. Some of us run to church and we hope that in the church things will be much better. There will be more peace. Things will be better. That's the place where there are God's people, God's children. We think by coming to church, we think by getting saved, like you and I are saved, life boisterousness will disappear or diminish. But in my little time that I have lived on this earth and that I have walked in the faith, having worked elsewhere, you know, I have not always been a pastor. I have worked in different spaces outside there before becoming a pastor. I came to church thinking, church is going to be so good. So one of the things that I actually thought would be so good for me is that I will always be reading the Bible. I loved the Bible. My wife can testify to you that uh, I would get into the matatu those days before we could afford a car. I am in the matatu and before Michuki came in, I would be with my Bible. You know, you know Michuki, the minister? You know that guy? Before he came in, we used to be packaged in matatus. Packaged. You would be put in between people's legs, including the legs of ladies. So how do you survive? One of the best ways to survive as a man was to occupy myself with the Bible. And so I would be right in between the legs of that lady, and I'm packaged from every direction, but I'm holding my little Bible and reading it throughout the journey. I loved the word of the Lord. And so I thought, first of all, when I go to Bible school, I'll read a lot of Bible. It was a lie. <laughs> I also thought when I become a pastor, I'm going to be reading a lot of Bible. It may not be necessarily true. Hear me, my friends. Life is busy. Whether you're in church or wherever you are. And I came hopeful that there will be more peace, that life will be so good, and I guarantee you, friends, I was in a shock. I discovered if you ever look for conflicts, there are actually more within the church. Do you agree with me? Conflicts, fights, suffering, difficulties, situations that are not easy. They are actually found more in church. And I will be letting you know why it happens like this. I have come to know that God in his own ordination and purpose has set the machinery of life in a way that it is never smooth. You don't say amen <laughs> to such a reality. God in his own ordination and in his own purpose, the way he has set life, whether you are in church or you are out, whether you are in the estate or in the corporate world or wherever you are, the setting of life by God himself, the, it ordained and purposed that it is never a smooth life. And I know many of us, because of our different theologies, we do not necessarily subscribe to the theology of suffering. But it's a reality. It's a reality. Peter, First Peter, the book of First Peter, first letter of Peter to the scattered church. He wrote to the church that was scattered all over Asia. This is the first letter that he wrote to the church. He wrote to encourage the believers. They were going through very difficult times. There was much suffering. In fact, if you look at the book of First Peter alone, the word suffering has been used 15 times. Because he was writing to believers, you and I, who are going through very difficult situations, going through suffering. And so he wrote to encourage them. I encourage you to read First Peter and just get to know what we are talking about. He wrote to encourage them. He wrote to show them that friends, it is still possible to live godly lives and lives of victory in the midst of suffering. It is possible. It is possible. Regardless 
of the difficulties and the sufferings that we go through. Allow me to just speak maybe a few verses for us to be able to understand what Peter is saying. First Peter chapter 4 verse 12 down. First Peter chapter 4. I'll read verse 12 down. Paul, uh, not Paul, but Peter. Peter writes as he encourages these people. And he tells them, and I would like you to listen very keenly. He writes and he said, beloved. In other words, brothers and sisters, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials. Concerning what? Concerning the fiery trials. I don't know what you think about fiery. Fiery trials, which is so, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. You know, suffering and trials and difficulties can come around you until you begin to think, is there anything strange that has happened about me? If you come from where I come from, you begin to associate it with a few other things. Who is this who is looking at me not with a good eye? Because it is a series of difficulties and challenges and sufferings. In verse 13 he says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. Rejoice. How do you rejoice in the midst of suffering? But Peter says, guys, you're going through difficult times. You're going through suffering, but rejoice. Why? Because you are worthy to be considered among those who should partake of the sufferings of Christ. Verse 15, he says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief. And he continues to quote other things. That's not the point of our suffering. If you're suffering because of corruption, if you're suffering because of all the bad things that other people do, then this is not what he's talking about. He says, do not be suffering because of those things. Verse 16, he says, yet anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. In other words, do not be ashamed that you are suffering as a Christian, but let him glorify God in this matter. Glorify God in that situation of suffering. I like verse 19. I'm just picking some of them. Verse 19. He says, therefore, verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing so. Is something called suffering according to? In other words, God can will. Have you ever heard these things? So am I teaching you for the first time? God can will. Let those who suffer according to the will of God. What do they do? Let them commit their souls to God. I would like to look at this thing we are calling suffering. Suffering is a state, either physical or mental. It's a state of undergoing pain, distress, or hardships in the face of a difficult circumstance or a loss. It is that state, whether it's physical or it's mental, of undergoing pain, distress, or even hardships in the face of difficult or difficult circumstances or laws. And we have many examples in the scripture of people who have gone through this. And I know you know some of them. You know the story of Job. You know the story of Job. Job is a very good example, and I would not belabor much about him. But this is what the very first verse in the book of Job says. It introduces Job and says Job was a blameless, upright man who feared God and he shunned evil. He was a believer of God. He was blameless. He was upright. He feared God and he shunned 
evil. So why would such a man who is so blameless, so upright, so good before God, he shunned evil. The scripture says he would pray for his sons and daughters every time they would go out, just in case he would pray and repent on their behalf, just in case they sinned. But we see this man losing everything. You know the story. He lost his wealth. He's one of the wealthiest in the region. He lost the entire wealth. He lost all the ten children. He lost his wife. He lost his health. He lost his status. He had a status. He lost his friends. Why would God allow his friend? And God was actually boasting about him. He told Satan, have you considered my servant? God was priding about Job. He was a good man. So God is priding about you, but he allows you to lose everything. He allows all that manner of suffering around you. That was Job. Let me give you one more example. Paul, the one, the man who has written many books of the Bible, the man we follow, the man we aspire to be like. Paul in the Bible. I think it's 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Paul says, listen to this. For we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. That's what he went through. So that we despaired of life itself. This is Paul, the preacher. He went through difficult situation until they despaired, him and his friends, in life. He says, indeed, we felt the sentence of death over our lives. Isn't that serious? So much pressure around Paul. And you can talk of many others. We have read Peter. How he says, do not take it, do not think it strange. Because of the sufferings, the trials, the difficulties that will come around you. As though something strange has happened. Don't think it's strange. You see, friends, as I've said, God in his own ordination and in his own purposing has set the machinery of life in a way that it is never smooth. Ask anyone. Whether you are rich or poor, whether you are a professor or uneducated, whether you are a pastor or just a congregant, whether you are from the royal family or just from a peace and farmer, the setting of life is in such a way that it will never be Really smooth. Life is said in a way that trials, difficulties, conflicts, sufferings are part of it. I used to watch some little movies some times ago, many years when I was a student in the university, which they were, I think, one of these Asian movies, they were calling it The Rich Also Cry. Anybody watch that? Many years ago. Let me see age. Those who are of age, I feel, I can see age. <laughs> The rich also cry. You are wealthy. You are from a royal family. But the issue of trials and sufferings around you is the same. That's how life is wired. I ask myself a question. So what does God benefit from our suffering? Have you ever asked that? When we are going through pain and difficult and suffering, does God sit somewhere and he smiles and he says, yes, look at that, look at that brother. 
Look at that. Look at that. What is happening to him? Is this what God does? What does God benefit from us going through difficult circumstances? Allow me to go back to the scripture that we read, Matthew chapter 14. And allow me to ask you some questions from that scripture. Did Jesus know that his friends, first of all, it's clear they were friends. But he didn't know his friends would be going through the tempest of the sea. Do you think he knew? Answer me. Yes, he knew. Do you think Jesus could have stopped that happening to his friends? Yes, he could. Did he stop that from happening? No, he didn't. He didn't. He knows it will happen. He leaves them alone and he goes to pray. And they are in trouble with the sea beating about them. Their lives threatened. He knows. He is able to stop it. He didn't stop it. What manner of a friend is this? What manner of a friend is he? There are two very significant things that I believe Jesus would have wondered allowed this situation to happen. And as I talk about them, I would like you to think about those situations in your life. Those circumstances that are so painful. As part of moving them from here to where he desires them to be, he will allow certain things to happen that he may occasion an opportunity to make a statement that nobody will ever forget. There are things we can learn through teachings. There are things we can only learn through practicals and demonstration. That's why... A true and a genuine church of Jesus Christ must not only preach the gospel, but must have the demonstration of the power of God, of the gospel that they speak. Where the sick are healed, the bound are delivered, the sinners are saved. That's why in this altar, we have witnessed a child who has never walked walking here in this altar. We have witnessed miracles. Because there is something that happens when there is a demonstration. And that's why he allowed this to happen. Number one statement that I believe Jesus wanted to make. Jesus wanted to make a statement that I, I, whom you know, whom you walk with every day, whom you worship, this man that you are walking around and touching and rubbing your shoulders with, I, I am he who is God of all. Don't see us rubbing shoulders daily like this. Don't see us eating food and me getting hungry just like any other. He wanted them to know that I, him, 
This man that you walk with. This man that we gather to worship every Sunday. He is not there just for us to gather on Sundays and lift our hands and worship him. There is something that we need to know. That he is God of all. That statement needs to be emphasized. That I am above nature. I am above those circumstances of life that you are going through. And I am here for you. He wanted to make a statement. That though life around you is full of boisterousness. I don't know whether this word is, is an English word. Although life around you is full of difficulties and challenges and trials and suffering. There is a provision to help you in God. And I, I am the answer. I that you worship. I that you rub shoulders with. I that you listen to every day. I am God. And I am your answer. I am above nature. That was the reason. Instead of going with the boat, 3 a.m., he comes on water. He is making a statement. Guys, you need to know I am of this body. I have a body like you. I have flesh like you. But I am God. I am above nature. I can defy nature. I can rule over nature. I am God. And I am the provision of God for you. That though life is full of boisterousness, though life is full of sufferings and challenges, I am here for you and I am able. I can defy nature for you. That's why for Joshua, he stopped the, the sun for a whole day. Did you know? The sun stopped. A whole day it never moved. Because of a servant of God who was serving him somewhere. I am God. I can walk on water. And I'm here for you. I am the answer. When you go through those things. I would like you to know you're not alone. I am here. I am able. So it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what suffering, what difficulties, what challenges he has around, allowed around you. There is answer in him. He defies nature to help you. Hey, what a beautiful thing is that. Isn't it beautiful? He defies nature to help you. So let's not just gather here on Sundays and just say we're worshiping him. That's not the point. Let's realize, let's understand from this statement. That he is God. That he is here for me. That he is able to make answer for me. But the second statement that I believe that he is making to these people. is is not only telling them I am God. I am able to defy nature. I am above all. I am here for you. He not only wants to do that. But he actually wants to make a statement. That you know what guys? It's not only me. You can actually rule over situations with me. <laughs> I expected a bigger amen. That's why he turns to Peter. And what does he tell him? What did he tell Peter? I am walking on water. I am defying nature. I am, and then Peter comes with his kierere. Good man, kierere is a good. And he simply says, come. Why, why are you coming? <laughs> How many of you believe in Jesus? Let me see by the show of hands. Hey, all of us believe in Jesus. How many of you will make a move to come when he says come? You are on a boat. You are in safety. He is there on water. And he says, come. Where? How many of you 
would step in on that water. I mean, yes, you know he is God. You have no doubt. But he is saying what? So you lift your leg to step where? Oh, God. Come. This is a statement he is making. He said, Peter and my friends, church of Jesus Christ, I am not only God who is able and who can rule over things, you can do it together with me. You can walk on the water. The water may be more boisterous, but you can. You can. Many of us have heard God speaking to them, but they have not been able to take the step that they need to. God has spoken and said, come. You look at that water and you're like, oh God, I'm not so sure. Let me pray again. And when you pray, you're expecting to speak something different. When he says, come, he says, why? Because you are able. You can rule over situation with him. You can walk on water. And Peter steps on the water and Peter begins to walk on the water. Has it ever happened? Has it ever happened? Can it ever happen again? Can it happen to you? How many of you believe it can happen to you? Jesus is making a statement. We can actually rule over situations that are around us. And these situations around us do not necessarily need to change. The boisterousness of the waters can remain, but we can rule over them. We can walk over them. They can remain wherever they are. You see, friends, I think we received an adulterated gospel. You see, the gospel is not for stories. The gospel is for demonstration. It's for believing. These things are not made for angels. That's what he was saying. You can do it, Peter. Come. Because these things are not for him or for angels only. The situations of distress and pain and sufferings around us are set in a way that you should actually rule over them, reign over them, trivialize them, overcome them in Christ. That's the situations around you. So I want you to figure out that situation around you. It's painful. It's difficult. It's distressing around you. But hear me, there is one who sets them. Amen. And the one who sets them is your your God. And he has set them in a way that actually you can rule over them. They don't need necessarily to change. They can change and he can change them. But even if they don't, you can actually rule over them. You can reign over them. You can trivialize them, make them insignificant. You can overcome them. That's why the Bible says there's no temptation that has come to you that is not common, that you cannot overcome. Have you read that in the scripture? There is not such a temptation. And even then, if it happens, God will make a way out for you. So there is nothing, even what you're going through right now. It looks so difficult. It looks so hard. It looks everything. But there is nothing. None of them is not a common thing to every one of us. And there is none that has not been measured. God measures. Can this one manage this? Yes, he can manage. Then he allows. When you see it happening in your life, it's because it's measured. And it has been determined you can overcome. You can rule over it. You can reign over it. And in any case, God will give you an answer out of it. This is the point, my friend, I'm trying to say. The plan of God is to raise a people who rule over situations, not a people who escape situations. Keep that in mind all through. God is not raising nice guys who just feel good always. 
And it is good to feel good. I love feeling good. Sinikweli. But that's not it. Guys, we need to put ourselves in the purpose of God and understand. His purpose is to raise a church, a people, believers, who go through whatever situation and they rule over it. Not a people who escape situations. You see why? Because God is more glorified when we go through it all and overcome in his power than when we live a life that has no issues. If you're living a life that has no issues around you, you're not glorifying God. What glorifies God more is when we go through it all, whatever it is. You go through death. You go through loss. You go through whatever suffering circumstance and you overcome it. God is glorified. God is glorified. He rejoices. Rather than when you have no issue. Your life is just smooth. Nothing happens. If you realize your life is just smooth, smooth, just know you are likely to be on the same side with the devil. But if you are on the side of God, he will push to you some circumstances. And you will feel like you are dying. You feel like you are finished. You feel like it can't ever work. You will call anybody, intercessors, pastors, apostles. You will do all those things to pray for you. Because it is not equal to you. The situations pushed around you. But when you stand there and overcome, God is glorified. So this is what we are saying. Every situation in our lives now, which we are calling suffering, is actually a grand opportunity for God to be glorified in our lives. Think about it like that. Every time you have this humongous situation that has come, you look at it and it's, you think it will crush you. It will finish you. Hear me? It is God-given, God-granted opportunity that you may receive glory. So stick in there. Stay there. That's why Peter said, let those who suffer according to the will of God do what? Commit their souls to him. And you will see what he is able to do. You will see what he's able to do. When you conquer or trivialize that brokenness, that singleness in your life, that childlessness in your life, when you conquer that cancer, that depression, that sickness, that joblessness, when you overcome that marriage or family problem that has been so much, you've been thinking it will crush you, it will finish you. When you conquer that difficult business deal that you have been gotten yourself into, that you are thinking is going to collapse all your businesses, when you rise up, stand before God with him and conquer it. When you conquer that court case, there is joy in heaven. You see, Peter began to sink. He was walking. Why did he begin to sink? Because he shifted his eyes from he, Jesus, and he put his eyes on the boisterousness of life, the bigness of the circumstance, the hugeness of the mountain around him. And he sees all oh, these waters will overcome me. And that's how you're looking at your situation. That's how you feel like dying. That's how you feel like it's over. Peter removed his eyes from Jesus. As long as his eyes were fixed on him. He walked on water. But when he began to look at the reality around them, these things we call reality. Did you know our reality is deeper than the natural reality? Our reality is at the back of everything. I have a savior. I have a God who is able. I don't care the bigness of the situation. The reality of men on this earth is logical. It's according to their logic. This problem looks this side. I'll get an answer that looks this side. Logical. The reality of they that believe God is beyond logic. It's that belief. It's that persuasion that at the back of everything, underneath are the everlasting arms of God. 
So the very worst that can happen to me if I fall is to fall in his everlasting arms. Hallelujah. That's our reality. There is joy in heaven. We're talking about grace. Grace, friends, as I bring this to conclusion, grace is when God himself steps in a situation where we absolutely have no way out. But he steps in and he himself makes a way out. That's grace. We have received a very flimsy definition of grace. We have always just believed grace is the unmerited. That is the desire of God. That's why God allows this. You see, when you and I are left everything working very well, our tendency is to ignore him. When you are in that situation where you know that you know that you know there is nothing you can do except you turn to him. What happens? You turn to him. So this situation of Peter became the greatest grace opportunity. The greatest grace opportunity when there was nothing absolutely he could do. It's either he sings or he sings until he remembers there is a man here. That's when grace sets in. Are you with me? When you are pushed by that situation, that sickness, that joblessness, that marriage situation, that circumstance, when it, it pushes you, Baka, you have no other way. Then you turn to the Lord like the psalmist. I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. When you are at that point, grace is released. So are you able to go through sufferings and still glorify God? Yes, because at that corner, when you are pushed, when you have no otherwise, absolutely, you turn to him. Grace comes. Do you remember about your salvation? Do you? Do you remember your salvation? What hope was there to save yourself? What hope? Is there any humanity that can save himself from our sins? We are absolutely wicked and evil. Except our help comes from him. This salvation doesn't come until you realize that. The only reason you got saved is because you rose up to realize, I, I can't make it. I can't do it. I can't forgive myself. I don't even have the power to forgive others. I can't. So Lord, I come as I am. That's salvation. You acknowledge you are at the end. At that point, you turn to him. And tell him you're the only one, like Peter. And he saves you. That's why I was saved. I had to reach that point. You have to reach that point. The reason why many are not saved is because they have maintained the control of their lives. And they do not want Jesus to step in in their lives. What about Joseph in a prison in a foreign land? What a hope was there for him? What about Daniel in the den of lions? What do you do when you 
your throne in a den where there are hungry lions. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Except when he steps in. This is grace. Grace begins to work when we reach that end. And many times, when you have that circumstance that you know there's nothing you can do, at that point, grace steps in. There's nothing that reduces a man to hopelessness. But when you're in a situation, there's nothing you can do. I sat there in Kijabe Hall field, and that Muzungu tall, looking like a Russian doctor, looks at me and he says, young man, is this your dad? And I said, yes, it is. Let me talk to you. Don't waste any money. Don't go anywhere. I have operated it. And I can guarantee you this one thing. There's no treatment of this thing. Anywhere in the whole world. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your money. Can you imagine the hopelessness? Have you ever been in a hospital? You have known somebody who has been very big, you know, like me. Strong. And because of a sickness, he is reduced to almost a limb. And you visit him in the hospital. You lay hold of his hand like this. And it looks like a... And you're so hopeless. There's nothing you can do. The doctors have tried. They have tried all things and nothing can work. At that point of hopelessness, he turned to him and said, Lord, only you can save me. But here is a beautiful thing. As I ask us to stand up on our feet. Stand up now. Here is a beautiful, most beautiful thing. Here is the most beautiful thing. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? It doesn't matter the boisterous of life. It doesn't matter how much the waves are beating. When your hands get into his hands, Bible says, and they walk together into the boat. It doesn't matter the sufferings, the difficulties, the challenges around you. When your hands are upon his hands, you can walk in the boisterous of life. He can remove it if he wants. He could stop the storm. Do you remember he rebuked the storm at some other point? He can, but he didn't. He chooses, let's walk together through it. This is the beautiful he puts his hands on Peter. He says, let's walk together through it. And they walk. And they walk majestically. In the midst of the boys that it is. The Bible says, when they reach the boat, the, the storm ceased. Why didn't it cease earlier? Because God wants to teach us a point. Hear me? I can remove the storm from your life. I can remove the sufferings and I have done it before but I can also walk with you through it. Do you think Peter was worried as they walked together? Hey, answer me. Do you think he was worried? There was no worry. Do you think that the waves were beating? Yes. Was the waters boisterous? Yes. Did anything change? No. The only thing that changed is that his hands were in the hands of Jesus. And as long as we are together, we can walk. We can walk. God has tuned this life in such a way that there is ever insufficiency in you that he may become our sufficiency. He will never allow a man to have a control of everything. Never. He always makes it that you will ever need him. As long as we put our hands in his hands, we can walk. We can go through it. He becomes our sufficiency. You remember our theme scripture? The Bible says, when he makes this grace available to us, then you are having all sufficiency. He becomes our sufficiency. Paul says in that scripture that we have read, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says the reason these things happen, but we despair in our life, is because he wanted us never to trust in ourselves. He wanted to strip off any trust that we have. Any profession that you think you have. Any networks and connections that you think you have. Anything he wanted to strip it out. Until he says, he wanted us to trust and trust in him. And him alone. That's why all this happened. 
That's why we almost despair in life. So that it will be healed. And healed. This is the setting of God. This is the allowance of God. That he becomes our only sufficiency. He makes us totally insufficient. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. He so says, not that there is any way we can be sufficient on ourselves. But that our sufficiency is in him. That's him. And when our sufficiency is in him, my good friend, you find something called grace. When you find grace, when you find grace, it can carry you through every boisterousness of life. It can carry you through every situation. It can carry you through every circumstance. And you can honor and glorify God in the midst of it all. Why? Because he becomes our sufficiency. And that's to raise up our hands above our head. Pray that this grace, that you find this grace. The Bible says that let us come to with boldness, with confidence to the throne of grace that we may, we may obtain mercy and find grace. Find grace. Find grace. May you find grace in whatever circumstance you're going through. May you find grace this year to carry and to host his presence. May you find grace to write over every circumstance. May you find grace Reach out to him now in the name of Jesus. In the name of
you speak because you are ready to help us. So we reach out to you today in the midst of our circumstances and situations and ask your help. Step in, Lord. Step in in this matter. Step in. And let it be done. Let it be done. Let us walk together in this matter. For I put my hands in your hands. I put my trust and my hope in you. And I look to you, Lord. I look to you. Let grace be released over my life. Give you thanks. Give you thanks. So I know there's some of us who are in very difficult circumstances. And for many years, you have sought the help of God. For many years you have waited on God. And you desire that today becomes that day that this grace is released upon you. I ask that as you release the others kindly remain behind. And let's have a moment to believe God together in this altar where grace is released over our lives. But it's possible that somebody is among us here and you've never given your life to Jesus. Jesus is not Lord. That grace of salvation you have not received and you're here. Please raise up your hand. Do not fear any man around you. Do not fear any woman around you. This is about you and the God of heaven. Raise up your hand and allow that grace of salvation to reach your life. Is there anyone who says, Pastor, pray with me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want this grace. Show me by the lifting of your hand. Thank you. 